It's my privilege to be your host and moderator tonight in our series on treaty, treaties as a sacred covenant. I'm going to say welcome to my basement. Uh, this is the quiet place that I can get to and, and host you all. In, a, in several minutes, you're going to be in Sandy Boucher's far more comfortable and well-appointed and very clean living room. Sandy, we're looking forward to that. I want to warmly welcome everyone to this conversation. I want to especially welcome Sandy, who is speaking to us tonight on what we as allies and advocates can do to advance the cause of reconciliation between settlers and Indigenous people. I'll be giving a bit of a fuller introduction in a few minutes, but in, in the meantime, Sandy, I want to say that it's great to have you here with us, uh, leading us in this conversation. Really looking forward to it. We are recording this event, uh, so if you do not wish to be seen or heard, then uh, I'll encourage you to turn off your camera, uh, and the button for that is should be down in the bottom left corner of your screen. Regarding a few technical issues, uh, Mennonite Church Canada is hosting this event, which means that Ellen Kim and Joan Schooley are doing the technical work uh, of hosting and facilitating tonight's conversation. Thank you, Ellen and Kim. If anybody has any technical issues, uh, then you can, can contact Ellen and Kim uh, through the chat feature uh, and they can try and help work that out with you. Our chat moderator today is Scott Morton Ninomia. Uh, we will have a question time later on and Scott is gonna be hosting those questions. Uh, you can ask a question at any time tonight through the chat feature and that will be then directed to Scott. And during our Q and A time, uh, Scott will then ask all the questions of Sandy. Uh, this does a few things for us. It helps us to get as many questions in as we can. It helps to bundle similar questions together. Uh, and it also gives you the response, the opportunity to just ask your question right away, hand it off, and then later on in the question and answer time, you don't have to be wondering, okay, what did I want to ask? How did I want to ask it? So these things are all yeah, addressed in that way. Uh, today is uh, session number five of our what had been six conversations, uh, we're gonna add a seventh one and put it in the number six spot. So in two weeks time, Skylar Williams is gonna be speaking to us, that's on April 12th. And then Marianne, uh, well, I'm just gonna say Marianne is gonna be speaking to us on April 21st. Scott, do you have anything to add about either one of those speakers? Uh, yeah, well, sure. Thanks, Herb. Um, Marianne Cabiosi is her name. I've been, I, she, she taught me how to say it. And when I first saw it, I would not have known, but I wouldn't have, I didn't know how to say Nino Mia when I first saw it either. And I wound up marrying that name. So here it is. And I've learned. Um, so, uh, yeah, Skylar uh, is going to be joined by Eric Lankin, who's a, um, uh, he grew up at Waterloo North Mennonite Church. Uh, they're both, Skylar is from Six Nations, and he'll be speaking about, uh, he's a land defender there, and they'll be speaking about the ongoing conflict that's happening there over land, over an unresolved land claim, and uh, how they established the land back lane, 1492 land back lane uh, camp there. And yeah, and Marianne is, uh, she's well known uh, in, in where I live on the Grand River watershed as though she's an Anishinaabe woman who, um, has organized an annual Grand River water walk every year for I believe the last three years. Um, so I'm sure she'll be sharing about that and many other things. So thanks very much Herb. Oh, and just while I'm, while I'm speaking, uh, someone had mentioned that they couldn't hear very well and was wondering if we could boost the sound. Um, so uh, I don't know if there's anything we can do, um, but uh, if hopefully things have gotten better and if they don't, uh, please let us know and we'll, we'll do some trouble, tech troubleshooting there. That's it from me. Thanks, Herb. All right. Thank you, Scott. And uh, I'm going to throw in Scott and I have a very COVID friendship. Uh, we probably met online probably at least 20 times before we ever met in person, at which point we barely recognized one another. And we discovered uh, that Scott and I became fathers within a few hours of one another some 20 years ago. So Scott, next Friday, in case I don't get to say it, happy 20th dad birthday to you. Thanks a lot, Herb, you too. 
let's uh, let's go to a, do a land acknowledgement, and uh, then Mim Harder will lead us in a prayer. Let's acknowledge the land we are on, and as we do this acknowledgement, please feel free to indicate the name of the First Nations lands upon which you reside in our chat feature. Many people have already done that. We acknowledge that the land on which we live, work, worship, and prosper is a traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and Attawandaran peoples. This ter territory is covered by the Upper Canada Treaties and is within the land protected by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement. Our ancestors and we came to this land seeking to, seek, seeking to escape oppression and economic deprivation. And we found in Canada a place to thrive and prosper in peace and security. However, we've come to realize that we have prospered by the policies and practices that have marginalized and devastated those who first inhabited this place. As followers of Jesus Christ, the love of Christ urges us on to pursue justice for our indigenous neighbors and friends. Scripture says that in Christ Jesus, God has reconciled us to himself, giving us the ministry of reconciliation. And there is no greater need or work for reconciliation than with those who first inhabited these lands. And so with this acknowledgement, we commit ourselves to working for justice for the indigenous people, uh, moving forward in a manner that fosters respect, dignity, and, and equality. At this time, I want to invite Mim Harder to open in prayer. Mim grew up in the Markham area with both settler and indigenous roots, and she strives to walk the path given her by Creator to braid understanding and build bridges between nations that live on this land today. Mim works with Kai with the Kairos Blanket Exercise, MCC Indigenous Neighbors, and Willow Grove as grandmother, lead facilitator, and trainer, providing the Kairos Blanket Exercise to groups in Ontario and in the US. Mim has been given the name of Wengashke Ikwe, which is Sweetgrass Woman. Mim, please pray with us. There we go. Can you hear me okay? Thanks, sir. You almost got my name right. Wingas. Sweetgrass. Um, it is often when you see it, it is braided. And there's uh, many, many, many teachings behind that braid, uh, many of which represent um, the journey that I have been on in my life. Um, and I'm so very honored to be able to carry this and hold it close to me. And if you ever get to smell it, it does smell sweet. So it is sitting on my desk here in front of me. Um, we're so honored that you have joined us tonight. I am going to light the smudge and I'm going to virtually smudge you all. And tonight I'm going to use sage, which is um, a cleansing medicine Science has actually proven that by smudging your house with sage and smudging yourself with sage, that it cleans the air, it cleans you. It's kind of like an antibacterial. So indigenous people knew long before science came along that um, we could clean ourselves in a good way um, and that we had the medicines the creator gave us uh, to help us on our journey. Um, to me, it's a beautiful smell. It always warms my heart when I light the sage. Um, so tonight, I just uh, thank Creator for all of you being present with us, for your listening ears, for your eyes that are seeing what is going on, for your mouth that you are able to speak and to speak words of kindness and honesty and truth with courage and compassion. And I also am thankful for your heart, probably more than anything else, because it takes a good heart to look at what is going on around us, to hear what is going on beyond the words that are spoken, to listen from your heart and to try to understand and to learn. 
And so tonight, I just ask you to keep that in mind as we listen to what Sandy has to say. Um, I have followed Sandy on Facebook for quite a long time now, but I have never actually, I don't think, heard you speak. So this is going to be amazing. I'm, I'm so excited for everyone to hear what Sandy has to say. So uh, creator be with us as we, we sit here with our hearts wide open and, and take in what is meant for us tonight. Um, miigwech, no way, all my relations. Thank you, Mim. If you would like to be in touch with Mim uh, tonight uh, or in the days following, if there's anything in tonight's conversation that has touched you or perhaps troubled you, uh, you can reach out to her uh, at her contact information. And uh, Ellen, I'm going to ask, and Joan, I'm going to ask that we just put up her phone number right now if we can. It's 519-745-8458, extension 362. This is a crisis line for Mim. Uh, and Mim says that if you're struggling, you can feel free to reach out to her. Tonight is the sixth session in our series on treaties as sacred covenants. It's our fifth session, I think. And most of that time we've been looking at things and, and where they are right now uh, and what it is that has brought us to our current circumstance. Uh, our planning team had originally targeted this series uh, for Mennonites here in Eastern Canada. And we've been very pleasantly surprised, if frankly not blown away at how far and wide the reach for this conversation has been. Uh, regardless of where we are and of what our background is, uh, I believe that Sandy is gonna have something to say to all of us tonight. Uh, tonight, Sandy is going to start pointing us forward in terms of what we can do uh, as allies and as, as friends of settlers, of, of Indigenous peoples. How we can move forward from how things are right now to a new, vi new vision of a fuller and a brighter reality in which we can all thrive and prosper together. Sandy is a proud Anishinaabekwe, a member of the Seine River First Nation. Uh, did I get that right, Sandy? You did. Oh, fairly close, somewhat. <laughs> uh, who knows full well? Sandy knows full well the devastation of colonialism, alcoholism, and domestic violence. And yet her teachings have allowed her to find wisdom and strength in her experiences, a wisdom that she now shares with her audiences. Sandy has been a speaker for over 10 years. She's written three books and numerous blog, Facebook, and Instagram posts, and has been a keynote speaker and has spoken at many seminars and conferences. And Sandy speaks out of her personal experience. St Sandy has traveled the road from woundedness to healing, from hurt and heartbreak to hope. And as she speaks life and encouragement into other people's lives, she does so from a place of authenticity, and integrity. Sandy has been there in a way that certainly I and so many of us, uh, many others of us here have not been there. Sandy has been there and she's not only survived but she's thrived and when she speaks she does so with the confidence of knowing that you will thrive as well. I first heard Sandy speak four years ago and some of the lines that, of things that she said and the picture that she drew out for us are still etched in my mind to this day. Sandy, your words have been wise counsel to me and you have made me a better pastor. And when we began to plan this series, I thought to myself, Sandy has to speak to us. A few other things that, uh, about Sandy that you might like to know. Sandy says that she does not work, but that she lives the dream. But when she's not living the dream, she can be found enjoying random road trips, visiting bookstores, camping, fishing, and backyard barbecues. She especially loves sitting in the sun reading, especially if she can do that close to some water. She enjoys doing traditional Ojibwe beadwork, knitting and crocheting. She loves spoiling her grandchildren with time and with toys. 
She is a diehard Montreal Canadiens fan, and I'm going to forgive you that because it reminds you of your father's French, French heritage, so I can put up with that. She also collects frogs simply because they remind her of her dad and his silliness. The only breakfast cereal she has ever eaten is Kellogg's Corn Flakes, and if she could, she would live on French fries. <laughs> I love French fries, but I need a bit of a broader diet than that. Sandy, so happy to have you with us. Really looking forward to this. God bless you. Oh, thank you so, so much. When I heard you say that, and I remember us meeting, I remember our discussions. It was absolutely awesome. But for you to say that that has made you a better pastor, just like, oh, you just can't get better than that. So thank you for sharing that. And I absolutely love it. So I am going to be sharing a PowerPoint presentation with you tonight. If there's one thing I'm conscious of is that different people learn in different ways. Some people, it's hearing the words. Some people seeing an image makes it so much easier for them. And other people, it's actually in the doing. We don't have a lot of time for the doing part tonight, but I definitely wanted to share some images with you. So I am going to share screen here. Uh, da -dee -dee -dee. So as mentioned, my name is Sandy Boucher, Mishko Paganon Quain Adishnakas Mangdodam. I'm Red Thunderbolt Woman of the Loon Clan and a proud member of Seine River First Nation in Northern Ontario. Although for the last almost three decades, I've lived in the city of Thunder Bay, which is on the traditional territory of Fort William First Nation in the 1850 treaty area. This is what I do for a living. I'm an inspirational speaker. I'm an author. I am most definitely an indigenous activist. I'm an experienced facilitator and MC, and that's how I help so many of my fellow members and communities and entities. I'm a TV host on our local Shaw Community TV. And when I'm not working, I'm a mom of two full grown children and two amazing grandchildren. My work can be summed up in one hashtag. I create space. I create space for indigenous perspective, for strong, powerful women to use their voices. I create space for healing and growth. I create space for what people keep describing as dumb questions and difficult conversations. I create space for reconciliation and even more importantly, empowerment. And I definitely create space for self-determination. But I am Anishinaabe Kwe. So one of the things I like to do is start every speech seminar or workshop I do with what I call the four thank yous. And it's my way to honor the teachings of the medicine wheel. And if you're not familiar with that symbol, I'm going to be sharing it with you in a couple of minutes so you will totally understand. But to get us started and in a good place, along with that amazing prayer from Mim, let me first off send out a thank you to God, creator, higher power, the universe, Dr. Phil Oprah. I don't care who you go to for your teachings. That's not up to me to decide. If it helps you to be a stronger, kinder, wiser person, then I'm totally going to support that. But one of the things I truly believe is that everything happens for a reason, which means I believe that if you're here tonight and you're hearing my voice right now, you're here for a reason. Something is going to be said tonight that is going to help you on your journey or with whatever challenge you might presently be facing. Now, I'm not egotistical enough to think it's definitely going to be something I say because I'm all that in a bag of chips. It might be a question from one of the participants. It might be something that's already been shared. It might be a question in the question period afterwards. The challenge is always to stay here. 
It is so easy, especially in this virtual event space, to get lost in what happened today or to be thinking about what's going to happen tomorrow. But when you do that, you miss all the the hints and help and clues that God or creator is trying to send to you now. So please do me a favor and do the best you can to stay with me for the next half hour or so. Now, the second thank you is to, ah, we got to go back here, to the organizers, because honestly, I always say without the organizers and all those people behind the scenes, I literally couldn't do my job. I'm the face you see, but there was a million emails behind the scenes and Zoom links sent out and there's been an amazing organizing team behind this event. So I say Chi Miigwech, which is a huge thank you to every single one of you. Thank you for your help with putting tonight together and for inviting me to join you in this space. The third thank you is a teaching directly from my mom and she was a Anishinaabe Kwe, which is an Ojibwe woman from Kuchijing First Nation in Northern Ontario. And she used to always say, remember to thank those that came before. Now, this is a perfect time to thank our ancestors, the people that walked before us, but it's also a great time to thank all those people that helped us get to this age and stage of our journey, whatever stage that is for you. I have met so many people that insist that I did it all on my own and that just isn't true. Because the reality is when we first started out, someone was literally feeding us. Someone was making sure we had clothes on our back, helping us get to bed, back out of bed, encouraging us to go to school, and maybe even fighting with us to do our homework. I would not have the amazing life I have now without the help and support and encouragement of so many people. And this is my chance to say thank you to them. So I hope you can join me in saying thank you to all of the people that have helped you. Now the last thank you, the fourth thank you is literally the one I lose sleep over. It's the one I think about all the time. The fourth thank you is to, whoops, to each of you. Because every single time I do one of these events, whether it's a half an hour speech or a full day seminar, I always think the same thing. You are sharing something absolutely priceless with me. Time out of your life journey. The reality is neither of us are getting this time back. I don't know if our paths are going to cross again. This may be the only time we have. So when I plan what I want to share with an audience, that's the bar I set for myself that it has to be worth your time, that because your time is precious. Imagine how our relationships would change if we always thought that way, that when our partner or child or coworker came to us, we realized they were sharing precious time with us. And I wanna thank you for sharing time with me tonight. In line with this fourth thank you, I do wanna highlight one more thing that I truly believe needs to be said and shared. And that is simply for all the non-Indigenous people listening to my voice right now, if you remember nothing else from tonight, please realize you are my fuel. Even if you're not able to do anything else, you encouraged me by showing up tonight, by being willing to listen, to ask questions. And as an Indigenous woman in Canada, I simply just do not take that for granted. There are still so many places that people are not willing to listen. So many places where I'm not heard. And when I have to deal with them, I think of people like you. And I remind myself, this person is being difficult, 
but not everybody is. And there are so many people that are trying to be part of the solution and do want to listen and hear. So thank you so, so much for being here with me tonight. Now, straight from my mom, she would say, this is all puzzle pieces. When I was a teenager and had some kind of challenge and I would go to her and ask her for advice, she would sit and listen like any good counsel does. And she would always look at me at the end and say, hmm, sounds like you don't have enough puzzle pieces. And what she meant by that is I probably didn't have enough information that if I couldn't see the solution yet, imagine trying to put together a thousand piece puzzle and you only have 10 of the pieces. The colors might not even match. They definitely don't fit together. But what if you added 10 more or 10 more? Maybe two or three are now fitting together. You add another 10, now you're starting to see a border. That's what I'm hoping to achieve tonight. We don't have a lot of time, but if I can add one or two more puzzle pieces to your puzzle, to the person you are, to your understanding, then in my mind, I've achieved my goal. So tonight, we are talking about reconciliation. And first, I wanted to talk about it in a very general sense, in the idea of what can non-Indigenous people do in a very huge, generic way of thinking about it. So first off, when I wrote The Path, which is my last book, and this is entirely dedicated to Canadian reconciliation, I realized the reason I wrote the book was I kept running into these caring, supportive, understanding non-Indigenous people who wanted to be part of the solution, but they had no idea what to do. They were terrified of making a wrong move. They didn't want to hurt anyone, especially Indigenous people, because they understood how much pain had already been inflicted on us but they had no way to move. They had no idea what to do. In my mind, what they needed was an action plan. And that's what this book is, Steps to Move Forward. Now, one of the first things I shared in the book is what I call the four sacred tools. And I believe if you take these tools with you everywhere, into every discussion, to every article you read in the paper or online, you're already gonna be standing on way more stable ground. Now, one of the biggest challenges with these kinds of speeches is remembering what's being said and you can't use the tools if you don't remember what they are. So I made it super easy for you. All you gotta do is remember the word path, like the way out. And it's an acronym for the four tools. Patience. This is not going to be resolved by next Tuesday. So do what you can today. Keep going. Awareness of what's going on for your neighbor in your community, and especially for people who don't look like you. Tenacity is just a really fancy way of saying don't give up. Maybe you have to give up for today. Maybe you're frustrated today. Maybe you need to take a break, but please come back because there's so much work to do. And last but not least, humility. Remain the eternal student. I learn something new every single day, even though I've been doing these work, this work for decades. So there you have it, patience, awareness, tenacity, and humility, the four sacred tools. Now, one of the other things I introduced in the book was this idea of stages, that there are different stages on this reconciliation journey. And if you look at the book, there's actually two paths. There's a path for indigenous people and all the stages and work we have to do and there's a path for non-Indigenous people. And that's what I'm gonna be focusing on tonight. The template I used was the medicine wheel and that's what I referred to earlier. So this 
is a diagram of the medicine wheel and the colors are in the quadrants according to my teachings. Different places have them in different places. That's just part of how many different, there's 649 different First Nations in Canada. So we tend to do things a little different. But no matter where the colors are, the medicine wheel is a teaching tool. It's a symbol we use to remind us of some incredibly important teachings. For one, the four parts of being. The fact that every human has an emotional, spiritual, mental, and physical part to them. And that those things have to be in balance for you to feel strong and empowered. Think of it as a four-legged stool. If you're in balance and you physically get hurt somehow, and I hope that doesn't happen, but using that as an example, the stool can balance on three legs for a while while the one leg heals. But if you're out of balance and only two are strong, that's really tippy and you're at risk of having something in the world knock you over. And if you're only standing on one, you're very susceptible to the outside world. It reminds us of the four colors of man. And this is something that so many people need to understand. We have no desire to take over the world as indigenous people. We just wanna be seen as one of the equal quadrants. We understand that other nations have valuable teachings that we can learn from, but it's when we come together that the world literally comes together. It reminds us of the four sacred medicines, sweet grass, sage, tobacco, and cedar, all with their purposes in helping us stay in balance. It reminds us of the four directions and how teachers come from all corners of the world and they appear for a reason. And it reminds us of the four life stages, the babies, youth, adult and elders, and the fact that every single one of these things are connected to all the other things. You can't affect one without affecting them all. Now, when I wrote The Path, the book, I focused on the life stages. So the idea is, for one, we start in the East, and, and Herb might remember this from that original seminar he was at. People want to start at the top. That's a Western thing. <laughs> we don't do that. We start in the East where every new day starts. So you start with the baby stage, which means if you're new to reconciliation, everything could seem new and overwhelming and even scary at times, just like a toddler would react to the world. That's okay. That's the stage you're at. Don't get scared. Just take your time. Learn you'll be okay. Now the youth stage, think of our teenagers. Now they have some knowledge and they want to go out there and they want to change the world, but actually the youth stage is still a learning stage. You might get a little gung-ho and want to change everything, and that's when you make the mistake of stepping on toes. It's very essential at that time that you continue your learning. The next stage is the adult stage. And I think we can all agree, adulting is not easy, no matter how you look at it. The adult stage requires action. We're not just learning anymore. We're not talking anymore. We're actually changing things. And that is not easy when it comes to reconciliation. And then finally, the land of the elders in the North where we're looking, reflecting back on the journey and offering guidance to those that come next. So if you look, whoops, go back a slide here. Now, this is the path as it was laid out in my book for the non-Indigenous people. Stage one, the baby stage requires an acceptance of facts. There was mention earlier of residential schools and treaties and all the things you've been discussing up to now. Honestly, if I could get back all the time that I put into convincing someone that those facts are true, we'd be so much further down this journey. 
So it's accepting the facts and having a desire to reconcile. The problem is when an indigenous person points out that that store clerk on your block is racist, you may not be able to see that. There's a really good chance that maybe they aren't that way with you. And this is where another teaching from my mom really comes into play. Now, literally, she used to make me and my brother do this. Stand in the middle of our living room, back to back. And she would get us to look around the room without moving, just moving our heads. And she would remind both of us that we can see so much of the room, but that for me, the one part I can't see was directly in front of my brother. And the part that he was blind to was obvious to me. This is a literal physical representation of I've got your back. When indigenous people are pointing out that there's an issue with whatever you're discussing, what we're trying to say is this is not helping bring the circle together. And there's a really good chance you can't see what the issue is because it's in your blind spot. But if we're going to move forward, you have to learn to accept the facts so we can move ahead. We're not trying to be problematic. We're just trying to share with you what we can clearly see. Stage two, unpacking the suitcase and identifying benefits and oppressions. So let's look at the suitcase for a second. What a crazy suitcase. Imagine for a moment on the day you were born, you're handed a suitcase and it's beautiful and it's empty. But almost immediately things start getting put into your suitcase. Things you see, things you experience, things you hear, things you're taught. And some of those things may be taught to you by people you love, but it just because you love them doesn't necessarily mean it's accurate. In Canada, so many of us were taught stereotypes about Indigenous people, including Indigenous people. We were taught certain things to believe certain things that we would never be able to achieve certain things. Unpacking the suitcase requires that you now look at the things you were taught with a more educated adult mind and decide for yourself, did that really make sense? I can tell you from personal experience, unpacking the suitcase, there's a really good chance that's a lifelong process. I am unpacking things every single day. Barriers that I put up between me and my own success, because way back when someone told me, Indigenous women can't do that. Even greater challenge is the oppression and benefits. Recognizing that the things you enjoy might have a negative effect on the Indigenous people when that was created. The fact that we're doing this presentation tonight in English is a reminder that the Indigenous people in this area were not allowed to use their languages that our children were taken to encourage them to speak only English to forget their home languages. If you look at the Western structures and systems that indigenous people are still being forced to adapt to, all of those were at the price of our systems and structures. We had economies. We had justice systems. We had ways to educate our children. They were just very different from the Western model. Reconciliation is recognizing that both systems have benefits. Stage three, hmm, that's the adult stage. And as I promised, not an easy stage. Stage three requires a commitment to do no further harm. It's a commitment to change behavior, to abandon the idea that Indigenous people should assimilate, that we should give up the ways we are 
to make it more convenient for others. And there's so much involved with this stage. And the exciting part for me is that it's very unique to every group, every structure, every individual. You get to decide how you're gonna work with local indigenous people by working with them and figuring out what works for you. And if you do it right, you enter into stage four, which is the new engagement style. And that is reconciliation. So if you're wondering why reconciliation hasn't happened in Canada yet, this is why. Because there's so much work that needs to be done before we can even get there. The truth part of truth and reconciliation. Now that's that big global way of looking at things, but the question comes down to, and the question's really simple, although it's not easy to resolve, how willing are you to change? Because if nothing changes, nothing changes. And you have to ask yourself that and be completely honest with the answer. The reality is reconciliation is hard. It is uncomfortable because if it's not uncomfortable, it's not reconciliation. It means you're still in your comfort zone and that means nothing's changed. Reconciliation for non-Indigenous people can be humiliating and embarrassing and it will be at times. That's the price of this learning curve we're in. It's admitting your great idea for that poster or that program or this new job description was not in fact a great idea when it's pointed out to you that there's challenges with the wording. And it's accepting that without explanation or excuse. And that's not easy to do, especially if you're in a situation where you haven't normally been challenged on how you phrase things. For non-Indigenous people, this process is, requires you sitting silently as your friend is corrected or called out, your colleague, your partner, and working through those feelings that you have going on without blaming us for wanting to change the things that harm us. And again, it is not easy. This is the stuff I do and work with every single day. It's not easy. If it was, I wouldn't be here tonight and you wouldn't be doing this speaker series. I just happen to think it's needed. That's why the four sacred tools, patience, it's gonna take time, acceptance, awareness, tenacity, and humility. Unfortunately, what I have seen so far is very few will choose to make those changes. But I pray a few of you in this audience will try because we need you to. As a Quay in this country, I need you to for the sake of my children and grandchildren. I'm coming up on my 57th birthday and I am very conscious of the fact, what kind of world am I gonna leave for them to live in? which is why I so adamantly do this work because I want it to be better for them. Now, this may just be a picture of a pretty feather to you, but eagle feathers are pretty huge in my culture. They are probably the most sacred item. And the way I always look at an eagle feather is half of that beautiful feather is me the indigenous people. The other half of the beautiful eagle feather is you, non-indigenous people. Every single time you speak up, you correct something that's inappropriate or just, just not needed in our new society, every single time you step up and allow space for an indigenous person to speak, the eagle feather is healed. And every single time you don't, a beautiful eagle feather is ripped in half. 
that's a powerful analogy, but that's how important this work truly is. Now, some of you may not want to get involved with the whole national discussion. Maybe you're looking more at a personal level. What can I do? I mean, I'm 60 years old. What am I going to do? Well, there's actually some things you can do every single day that added up can make a huge difference. Now, I don't know if you caught that in my introduction, but I actually live in the city of Thunder Bay. Thunder Bay is known nationally for its anti-Indigenous racism. Recently, well, probably about a year ago now, I was asked to speak to a group of future leaders here in the city of Thunder Bay. And the question I was asked was, what can we do as individuals to move forward so that all Indigenous people will have a positive experience as residents or visitors in Thunder Bay. And I should point out at this point, I was given 10 minutes to answer that question. One of the things we have to acknowledge is these discussions need a little more time. But I was up for the challenge and I was not saying no to the 10 minutes, so I came up with a handout and I passed it out to them and I read the 10 steps and explained them to the audience. You can use the exact same steps, just cross out Thunder Bay and put Canada. Step one, in a time when so many feel powerless, responsibility is power. Own that making Indigenous people welcome here is the responsibility for all of us. It's not up to our leadership. It's not up to our elected officials. Every single one of us carry that responsibility. Step two, own your privilege. And honestly, as an Indigenous woman, I have tons of privilege. I got to go to high school in my own community. I have clean drinking water. I have access to healthcare just down the street. So many Indigenous people do not have those luxuries. Know your experience is not the experience and that other people may see things differently. And I highly suggest you take the quiz. All you gotta do is Google Unpacking the Invisible Knapsack. It's available free online for download. And it really may change things for you when you realize that the color of a Band-Aid doesn't match the skin color of so many people, you start realizing how the system was built just to support a certain group. Step number four is be an ally, but understanding that that's not a noun, it's not a job title, it's actually a verb, it requires action. So take that action. And the best instruction I ever heard on how to be a good ally is written right there. One, shut up. Be quiet is a nicer way of putting that. Listen to what Indigenous people say they need and do only what is asked. Because if you step up with solutions and you go running with them, then once again, that's another culture trying to decide what we need. And that's how we got into this mess in the first place. Empowerment is supporting us to find our own solutions and understanding that the solution in the Seine River First Nation may not apply in Kuchiching, may not apply in the beautiful Haudenosaunee communities, may not apply to the Coast Salish. Our communities are different and beautiful. And that's why reconciliation there can't be a one-size-fit-all solution. Step five, educate yourself on what internalized oppression looks like. Recognize that there's three ways humans react to long-term oppression, and you see them every single day. Look at any oppressed group. Violence is a natural human reaction. When someone keeps telling you that you're not worth anything, you're going to lash out. That's option number one. Option number two, in my opinion, is even scarier. That's acquiescence. 
that's giving up. That's the people that say things like, why even try? It's never gonna change. Why bother? That is dangerous. And then the last one is nonviolent resistance. And that's when we carry our picket signs and we do our walks and we give speeches like this. That's our way of trying to fix things, not giving up and not choosing a violent option. So the next time you hear what's going on in the First Nations community, maybe remember that it might just be a natural reaction to long-term oppression. If you want to learn more about internalized oppression, because there's so many signs of it, youth giving up on their dreams, people not choosing to speak up, this is the book to get. And no, I didn't write it. No, I don't get any, <laughs> any money from recommending it. There are very few texts on internalized oppression because the people that normally do studies aren't the people that are oppressed. This book is a beautiful combination of academic studies and personal stories, and I highly recommend it. Step six, support any and all nonviolent resistance. Don't take the mic. Don't be using your voice. Share their stories, not yours. Support it because that is the healthiest way for oppressed people to get past those barriers. Step seven, this is the one that I highly encourage you to do and it sounds so minimal and it is so important. Understand a positive experience is dependent on relationships. Apologize and say, I'm sorry when you're getting by someone, an indigenous someone. Say excuse me with a smile, comment on a beautiful baby, hold open the door and understand the shock because again, we're not used to being treated that way. And even me with all my success, I would still be surprised at this. Forgive the rudeness because that violence that oppressed people sometime go to, it might, we have youth here that say rude things to non-Indigenous people as they walk by. That's a young man trying to prove he's not scared of the oppressor. Is it the right thing to do? No. But if you understand where it's coming from, it's easier to forgive him. Step eight, hold and make space for someone. If there's no Indigenous people at your meeting, bring one to the next meeting. Suggest diverse memberships when you have planning committees. Pass the microphone if there's an Indigenous person in the room and you're talking about Indigenous issues. Make room for Anishinaabe Moen, which is our culture and our language. And that applies to all of the nations. Step nine, call out racism. You have to disrupt it. Accepting, silence is acceptance and we have to stop accepting this. Give up your seat, say to the victim, let me help you get in between the person saying the racist things and the victim. Often when they see you're supporting the person they're attacking, they go quiet or tell them to be quiet. This is violence you're witnessing and expecting the victim to be the one to stop the attack is asking an awful lot. But sometimes all it takes is another non-Indigenous person saying, no, you know what? Not in my city. And step 10, use the four sacred tools every chance you get. Patience. This will not be solved in one day. Awareness of what's going on in your community, especially for people who don't look like you. Tenacity. Keep going. Please don't give up. And humility set out to learn every single day. That's reconciliation and that's what you can do. And I know it's hard. It's so much easier to just keep doing what's being done. But if you choose to do nothing, then you're choosing that this country is still gonna be horrific for indigenous people like me and my family. And I don't think that's a choice you wanna make. 
it's unpacking. And as I mentioned earlier, I unpack almost every day. And because of my unpacking process, I've actually added a number 11 that I'm going to share for the first time tonight. And here it is. Number 11 is recognizing that white people often get really upset. They bristle or they resent being grouped together. Like I'm an individual, why are you doing that? Yet marginalized, racialized and indigenous people, we fight every single day to be seen as individuals and not a group, not a stereotype. I'm hoping tonight as I mentioned earlier, that I was able to add a couple little puzzle pieces into your knowledge base, because honestly, I believe in you. I would not do this work if I didn't believe in you. And I believe that just like me, you are part of the solution. Your voice is valuable and you can create change. And if we do it together, well then the future is going to involve reconciliation. That brings it to the end and it's three minutes to eight. <laughs> I'm gonna bop out of this screen share now. Hopefully that worked for everyone and made sense. And I'm hoping there's some questions or comments or feedback. Well, thank you. Thank you, Sandy. That was fantastic. And, uh, you know, you, you took a, I think it, was it a two day seminar or an eight hour, yeah. one day seminar that I sat in on and that, uh, you now presented in 30 minutes. So that's a lot of material there. And, uh, I remember a few things yet that didn't get mentioned today. Uh, Sandy's book, uh, that, uh, she was showing to us and I am now going to plug uh, the path. Uh, look it up. I believe it's on Amazon. Isn't that right, Sandy? No, actually go to my website. So okay. sandyboucher.com. Sandyboucher.com. And you see how to spell her name on the bottom left corner of her window. Uh, sandyboucher.com. Look it up. The path. It's wonderful. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. It was, uh, was uh, fantastic. Uh, so Sandy, now we're going to do a mug presentation and, uh, so here is the gift that we sent over to, uh, to Sandy. Thanks to Ron Flaming to make sure that that got to her in time. And uh, what, are you, what are you drinking out of there? Do you have anything in there? I got some water in it. I thought it was oh. just appropriate water and this beautiful mug. And by the way, like I said, I've saved the papers that came with it. I mean, it was just amazing. I was so blown away. So thank you so, so much for this amazing gift. Awesome. Awesome. Glad to have you. And Scott, do you have any questions that have come in for, for Sandy? I'm ready with a few questions. Yes, thank you. Herb. Um, yeah, so here's a few questions and this will get us started off. And then I encourage anybody who's got other questions or um, things that you'd like to hear more about from Sandy, um, please feel free to add those in the chat. Um, maybe the one that I'll start off with is uh, I'll start off with this one. Um, you mentioned um, as Indigenous, when you had the four quadrants, the, the four different colors, you mentioned, uh, we just want to be seen as one of, uh, speaking for Indigenous people, of course, as yourself, we just want to be seen as one of the equal quadrants. We don't want to take over. So that's, mm -hmm. I, I wrote down that quote, because I, I see, um, this is maybe from my own experience, but I see sometimes uh, settlers who hear, who see land back camp or whatever, and they, there's this knee jerk reaction to say, you know, where does it stop? And and so I wonder if you have any thoughts. And this is obviously, uh, you know, as settlers we have to do this work. So I'm not putting this all on you, uh, but I'd love to hear some of your thoughts about how how do we engage people who are having those kind of fears and overcome them? I mean, you've given us lots of ideas already, but specifically, if we're hearing somebody saying something like that, like, you know, now they've got land back this and land back that, and, you know, and I say they in quotes for, you yeah. know, you'll hear people othering Indigenous folks. And so anyway, we'd love to hear some of your thoughts on that question. I know you're going to be totally surprised when I say I've heard that. <laughs> I've definitely heard that before. So 
And what I find is it's not now, not always, but often it's not even that they fear they're going to lose the land. When you get to the root of it, what they're afraid of is that we're going to treat them the way they treated us. Hmm. That if we took the land back, that we would send them off into communities. And that is not any indigenous culture I know. We are, that goes directly against my medicine wheel teaching. So that's, that's just not it. That would show that I haven't healed at all. So that is applying a Western attitude of this, you know, get them and get even kind of thing that doesn't even appear in our cultures. So asking them, you know, well, what would that look like to you? Why would that be so scary? Like, the other thing that we have to acknowledge is that in Canada, even when the land, quote unquote, has been given back, when it's supposedly under Indigenous control, that's only until the federal government wants to do something. Just call up any pipeline you want to <laughs> discuss, right? So I've always said that we have reached reconciliation when an Indigenous person or nation can say no, and it's actually listened to. Mm -hmm. And until that happens, we have a lot of work to do. So... Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And a couple of people had comments in the in the in the chat about that. One person said white fragility. That's what we're talking about when somebody says. Um, so and, and can I touch on that for a second? I mean, white fragility, we like to throw that out there. White fragility feels awful. <laughs> and that's what I touched on in that that slide when you honestly are trying to give a speech because you're a good person and you want to help and someone points out that one of the words in your speech is problematic that's embarrassing it hurts a lot of people that is the end of their reconciliation work and that mm -hmm. what they are experiencing is white fragility the good news is it's not fatal you will get over it. You will feel better. Honestly, you know what? I, and this is just me personally, I refuse to crucify someone for what they didn't know. So if you use a word and you didn't realize it's problematic, I have to point it out to you or else I'm going to keep getting hurt every time you use it. And you might be a little embarrassed, but I mean, you have more knowledge now. But once I explain it to you, the responsibility transfers from me to you. Mm -hmm. The first time you used it, you didn't know better. So that's okay. If you use it again, you now do know it's problematic. And that makes you part of the problem, not part of the solution. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's really interesting too. And I find some, sometimes it's about how, like, how do we create safe spaces that aren't completely comfortable but so like you're saying like you don't crucify someone for you know making a, an honest mistake you know that that that's not gonna that, you know they're not gonna move forward in any way but exactly but then how, do you, how do you challenge them to think differently then is, is i guess part of the problem part of the challenge and you've given us lots of ideas for how to do that yeah, and one of the things, please keep in mind, like I do those seminars, I create those safe places and I tell the non-Indigenous people, ask your questions. Don't even worry about the words you use. I'll explain why you should or shouldn't use words after you ask the question. No one's gonna get upset. I wanna have this discussion with you. But what people have to understand is it took years of healing on my part to be able to hear those questions. Yeah. To be able to recognize that this person is only sharing what they've been taught. It doesn't make them a bad person. They don't know any different. I can work with, I don't know. I don't care is what scares me. Right. So. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's fantastic. Um, yeah. There's a couple other, um, there's a couple other questions in the chat. Um, okay. Let's see. Uh, 
I have to say again that two of these these questions come from folks at my church, just saying, but um, I'm just joking. Uh, it's true, but uh, so uh, Janet says, thanks for your wisdom and helpful concepts. I would value hearing from you about what might be some helpful ways to respond to backlash, which is what we were talking about a little bit. Uh, often uh, when progress towards equality and reconciliation happens, there's backlash that can be harsh and feels like we're going backwards. What are some healthy ways to respond to backlash? I'm not backlash to what? Like, uh, I'm not really sure. To, um, I think an example of this would be around, you know, now, now, in, like in Kitchener uh, last summer, this past summer, uh, we had the land back camp that was set up in yes. Victoria Park, which is a, and, and I'm sure I, I'm positive actually uh, that there was backlash to that. Like it was, it's this, it's this positive assertion of indigenous peoples to say, you know, indigenous peoples have been here for a long time. This is us saying, this is our space too. You know, there are all kinds of things, but there was this backlash of, you know, now they want our land, they want our land back, you know, why? Yeah. So, so how do we, I, I guess Janet's asking, how do, how do you respond to backlash? Um, so I have another image that I use often, and I'm so glad you brought that up because I really want to share this with you. So imagine a wall, <laughs> like a Trump style kind of wall, that long wall. <laughs> what an easy reference to use. How handy. But anyways, imagine the wall is like the width and height of a table. So you could climb up on it if you wanted to. And on one side of the wall is indigenous people. On the other side of the wall is non-indigenous people. So there's people like me and a whole bunch of indigenous and non-indigenous people. We're dancing on the wall. And we can jump off into indigenous country or into non-indigenous country. We know who we are. We know how to be respectful. It's okay. We're, we're comfy in either place. We're respectful. We're humble. We're good. The people I speak to, which is every single person watching this right now, if you're not already up on the wall with me, then you're touching the wall. You're, you're looking at the wall. You're interested in getting on the wall, right? And those are the audiences, the out and out problematic people that cause that backlash don't come to my seminars, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> Let's get real here on both sides of the wall, and I wanna be crystal clear on that, there are people so far away from the wall that they don't even think the wall exists. They're those ones I touched on earlier that say things like, it's never gonna change, why bother? Those indigenous people are never gonna get it together. Indigenous people are saying the government's never gonna change, why even bother? If you take all of your time and energy and try to speak to the people that are so far away from the wall, all you're gonna do is exhaust yourself. So what you have to do is speak to and have conversations with people that are open to learning. And you can try giving a little bit of information and they, if they don't wanna hear it, then you know, mm, they're too far from the wall and leave it there. It goes back to the four sacred tools. As my elder puts it, this isn't the generation in their family that gets it. And that's okay. Maybe my daughter's going to work with them or my granddaughter or your child or your grandchild. They're not ready yet. And that is not up to you to change them because you might as well go talk to the wall. All you're going to do is, is exhaust yourself. But if someone says, I don't understand that's a real big hint that they're standing right next to the wall and all they need is information. So the backlash is going to happen. It's yeah. fear-based often and it's people not that just like the sound of their own voice, right? Yeah, okay. Um, there's a couple other questions here and I'll, I'll, just, uh, I'll just keep going through. Um, Beth is asking, uh, similar to the first question, uh, as a white homeowner now living on land I've learned was taken from indigenous people, what should I do to truly make it better as opposed to just trying to lessen guilt? So yeah, what are some of the, the practical things we can do? And you know, I'm, I'm one of those white homeowner, homeowners too. Okay. So 
I'm going to answer this question and it might sound rude <laughs> and I don't want it to be, but I'm going to just put that disclaimer in front of it. If you're going into the reconciliation game and as a non-Indigenous person, you want to feel better, you're thinking about the wrong person because reconciliation is not about you. Right. So as soon as you catch yourself trying to make yourself feel comfortable or less guilty, you're focusing on the wrong person. Now, as far as I'm going to speak to that guilt for a second, treaties, people love to misinterpret the word treaty. So I always like to use the word contract. A contract was signed, even though <laughs> the Indigenous people, it was misconstrued and, and they didn't what they thought they were signing is not what actually happened. But in those agreements, land was given to non-Indigenous people and we got other things like our post-secondary education, our very limited dental and medical coverage, things like that. So there was an exchange of benefits. The one I love is when people say, well, why do their education get paid for? Or why do their eyeglasses get back? get covered. And my mom would be the first to say, well, we could cancel the contract, you give the land back, and we'll stop having these benefits. <laughs> Easy peasy, right? The problem comes up. And I have to say this, so often, the problem is not the individuals in this country. It is the actions that the federal government has taken or not taken time and time and time again. If the treaties were honored in the nature of the way they were written, we would not be doing these seminars. But every single time the federal government buys a pipeline to run it through a First Nation that doesn't want a pipeline, you're the ones that end up paying for it. We end up in these horrible arguments in our communities because we're frustrated and we're trying to change things and, and they're telling us to come out and vote. Well, it's, we're the ones they negotiate with. They never negotiate for us. So mm -hmm. it doesn't even really make sense. Like there's not a First Nations party, right? That would scare the daylights out of a lot of people. <laughs> that would make a whole bunch of people really nervous. So does that make sense? Feeling, I really try to encourage people to stay away from guilt and shame. And here's why. You didn't ask for your privilege. And I wanna go into the next question I see talking about privilege. Mm -hmm. You were born with it. You didn't ask for it. There's no sense feeling guilty about it because you can't give it back either, right? So mm -hmm. that's just the reality. The only thing you can do with privilege is use it for the benefit of the people that don't have it. So if you're at a meeting and something comes up that's problematic and there's no Indigenous people in the room, there's a perfect chance to use your privilege and you can say something, even if it's just to say, you know what, this is going to involve the First Nation community down the street. We should probably have some of their representatives here. Mm -hmm. That's how to use privilege. When you're in a store and you see a sales clerk being rude or obnoxious to an Indigenous person and you speak up and say, wait, wait, you know what, why are you speaking to them like that? That really sounds kind of offensive. That's you using their, your privilege because as a First Nation person, if I say I'm offended, I'm going to get dismissed as a troublemaker. If you say you're offended, they're going to think, oh, paying customer, I'm about to lose money. We must listen to this person. I hate to say it, but it's true, right? Mm -hmm. Especially when it comes to our businesses. So don't feel guilty about your privilege. You are carrying, this is probably a lousy metaphor, but a weapon that could be very valuable in this fight because you are literally still getting into rooms that I can't even walk into. Mm -hmm. So if you use your voice and you educate yourself, that's privilege. Don't feel guilty about it, use it. <laughs> we need you to use it. So, so. Our, our privilege could be like a sword that we beat into a plowshare. I'll just make it more palatable to our Sunday night <laughs> listeners. <laughs> privilege, and like I said, privilege is everything. You got to do that quiz. 
privilege is walking into a music store and finding your type of music. It's been, it was, took a long time to get powwow music into music stores. Mm -hmm. It's able to walk into a grocery store and find the traditional foods that you eat, right? Uh, there's, like I said, the Band-Aid. Uh, indigenous people, especially in Anishinaabe, we have very thick hair. Finding a hairdresser that even knows how to cut our hair is rare. So if you have a hairdresser that does great things with your hair, that's privilege, right? Being able to go into a hospital and not being asked how much you drink as the first question is privilege. Yeah. Privilege is not having them, you say you don't drink and they still lean closer to try to smell your breath. That happens every single day, that's privilege. I've had it happen now. I have fairer skin than a lot of my family, including my own son. And I've watched cabs, taxis, drive past obviously indigenous people to come pick me up. And it's like, okay, one, that hurt. Two, get back there and go get those people. Yeah. That's using my privilege, right? No, I'm not allowing you to do that. They were waiting here first hold the door open for them and enjoy the shocked look on their face. So. Okay. Yeah. Somebody awesome. in the chat just said, uh, that's the best expl explanation of what I can do with my privilege to help bring reconciliation. Thank you. Uh, someone's asking how booked up are you, Sandy? I would love to bring you to Waterloo Region to hear, to, for, to, to speak to others about that. Uh, Reconciliation, the reconciliation process. Honestly, uh, my answer, well, this was prior to COVID. Let's keep that in mind. Um, I have always said I go anywhere I can be of help. I, the very first seminar Herb was at, my book launched in London, Ontario, mm -hmm. right? So that was nowhere near my area. So, I mean, if I can be of help, absolutely. That's what I'm here for. So Great. Well, um, yeah. Lorna, I think we have your uh, contact information because you registered for this, so we can probably connect you if that's interesting. And I'm, I'm in Waterloo Region too, so I'd love to meet you in person. <laughs> and there's a lot of us. There's a lot of us on the call who are in Waterloo Region and from all over the place. Um, can, can I just do a quick shout out? I don't know if he's still in the room, but I was totally shocked when people were signing up. I think I saw Dave Ivany sign up. And that's actually a name I recognize. So I was like, what? Seriously? So if he's here, shout out, because that was pretty amazing. So St. Paul's on Dundas is always looking for a speaker. Oh, that was a flashback to my Toronto days. Whoa. <laughs> uh, so you'll have lots of other offers. Um, I have another, uh, Herb, how's our, how are we for time? I have another question. Um, yeah, maybe I'll end with... at least at least five minutes. Okay. Yeah. Um, so maybe I'll ask this one. I think you've already spoken to this a little bit, Sandy, but I was wondering you, like when we heard your introduction, obviously you've been through, I don't have to tell you, but just to reiterate to everyone that you've been through a lot like colonialism, alcoholism, racism, so many different negative experiences. And we're uh, I can speak for myself, and I think I'm speaking on behalf of a lot of us to say that we're so honored and happy to be here and to hear that that just as being here is fuel to someone like you. Okay. So my question is just how um, how can we as settlers who are, you know, out in the world interacting, hopefully interacting with a lot more people once the vaccines get going, but how can we be fuel to others, uh, especially to Indigenous folks who might need fuel at whatever point they're at in their life. Uh, and, and how can we do that in ways that is not falling into colonial patterns, like yeah. the patronizing or the, you know, in ways that are uplifting and that are, uh, you know, all the good things rather than the bad, the bad patterns that we've gotten into over the last 500 years. Yeah. And I love you for asking that. So thank you for that. Um, honestly, and again, that was that slide I was speaking to. Uh, Treat us like you're happy we're there. <laughs> Smile, you know, as we walk by you, 
We're not going to know what to do with it. So don't expect to smile back. But I have met youth that a non-Indigenous person said, you know what, wow, you're such a smart student. You know, you're going to do amazing things. And they went home and like four days later, they're still talking about that non-Indigenous person that thinks I'm worth something. Mm. And that's heartbreaking. But that's the power you have to, to smile at the babies, right? To say, you know, oh, excuse me, you know, have a great day kind of thing. Anything like that, that actually makes us feel welcome on our own land, as opposed to everything that teaches us we're not welcome here. Yeah. So it is all of those little, excuse me, what a gorgeous little baby, you know, like, have a great day, a smile. Like I said, they're not going to know what to do with it, but every single one of those means something. And only say it if you mean it. Because we all know <laughs> we can pick up on the person that says, have a nice day, and they they don't want us to have a nice day, right? <laughs> like it's written all over their face and in their phrase. But you have the power to truly to override everything that we've been taught. I thought, and I know I'm running out of time here, but I can think of this one employer I work with. She had a young indigenous woman working for her and something happened and she started showing up late or not showing up for work at all. So the employer reached out to me and said like, I need to talk to her, but I don't know what to say because I don't want to embarrass her. I don't want to like, you know, I don't want her to quit because I really need her here. She's so amazing with her clients. She's so intelligent. Like, what do I say to her? And I just kind of smiled and said, tell her everything you just told me that she's intelligent and she's great with the clients and you really need her there because I guarantee you, she doesn't believe any of those. She has no, she thinks you are now judging her and hating her. She's letting you down. She's telling herself, I knew I could never do this because that's the way we've been raised to believe we can't be successful. And when we screw up, we think it's reinforcing that. I got a call the next day from the employer. She was crying. She had told the employee exactly what I said. The employee started crying, hugged her. All of a sudden, she was seeing all this initiative from the young woman. She was on top of the world because we are so used to being judged that when someone non-Indigenous actually says, I want you here, I, you're a valuable part of our team, you have no idea the power of those words. So, thank you so much. I'm really, I'm really glad that uh, speaking of young Indigenous women, there's one right here. Her name is Bertha. She's my daughter, and she's Mushwal Inu uh, from Labrador. And she's going to be upset that I put her on the spot, but I won't leave her on the spot for long. But anyway, I'm glad that she's getting to hear some of what you have to say. Awesome. Um, awesome. So I think. That's, uh, I, I think I have to hand it back over to Herb now. But thank you so much for answering all these questions. It's been wonderful having a chance to, to hear from you and have a chat with you too. No problem, thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Sandy. Uh, so we're gonna end uh, our, the formal part of our evening right now. Uh, we're gonna have a closing. However, the conversation is going to continue. If you would like to stay and ask Sandy a few more questions, We'll go for another 15 minutes, uh, but right now we are going to wrap it up. Uh, Mim's going to say a prayer in a minute here, uh, but Sandy, thank you so much uh, for, for your words, for your encouraging words, your challenging words. Uh, you know, as, as white people and perhaps uh, even more so as Mennonites, it, it's, we always want to do something. Uh, mm -hmm. And as allies, we're in that complicated place of, uh, of not doing something. Uh, but uh, of, of standing back and not grabbing the microphone. Uh, so thank you for that challenge. Thank you for that great word. Um, I have to speak to that after the prayer. <laughs> <laughs> you can do something. It's just doing the right thing. So remember well, that. <laughs> standing in the background. Yeah. The, um, well, and you know what? I want you to talk a little bit more because something that really struck, stuck with me for such a long time still does as still shaped me is, is, 
only saying and doing that which moves the ball forward. Yeah. Um, yeah. But Mim, uh, well, hold up. First of all, I have to say thank you to Mennonite Church Eastern Canada, to Joan and Ellen. Thank you guys for your tech support and for making today tonight possible. Thanks to all the organizers. Uh, for those of you who are leaving, our next seminar is one that we have just scheduled. It's on April 12th. Uh, information for that will be out. You can look it up. You can probably Google, Google it. If you Google treaties as sacred covenant, you'll probably find the information that way. I think we're gonna be emailing it out to all of our registrants as well. That's a new one coming up on the 12th and then on the, after that is the 21st. Scott, you wanna jump in? Well, just with a really quick, uh, I'll put it in the chat box. If you Google M-C-E-C-T-R-W-G, it'll take you to the webpage where all the talks and everything like that'll take, that's like the one place to find everything about this series. So I'll put it in the chat. Excellent. And yeah, Mim, would you like to have a closing prayer? We'll need to take you off mute there, Mim. Okay. Sorry, my Zoom cut out just for a second there. <clears throat> Normally when I close, I just do it off the top of my head um, and I go with uh, whatever spirit is giving me to say um but i was on a walk today and it was interesting because i there were so many things that came to me and sandy you touched on a lot of them um and it's just really good to hear someone else put into words i can very much relate with um a lot of things that you've said um so i'm actually going to read what i wrote because i came And sometimes that is put those words on the paper and actually see them. Um, so what I wrote was, anyone can go to church. Anyone can say they are Christian or of any religion. Anyone can put on a ribbon skirt. Finding those who live the teachings that go with the ceremonies, those that commit, persevere, that are resilient, that gain knowledge, the walk in gratitude and kindness, with honor, with wisdom and honesty, with courage and with truth, that have respect for all the earth, they're all that our earth encompasses. It is those people that we need to learn from and listen to. And Sandy, I think you fall into that category. It is those who walk with open hearts, are vulnerable when they share their story, when they share the wisdom from their journey, it is those we need to believe because this is not an easy task to do. I was listening to Rick Hill the other day and he was talking about the two row wampum. And he said something I hadn't really caught before. He said the ancestors wanted us to make friends with the people on the ship. Didn't matter what the color of their skin, we were to make friends with them. And we are linked, whether we like it or not. We may be in a canoe and they may be in their ship, but we are sailing down the path beside each other. So what one does affects the other. What one does to this earth affects us all. We need to treat everyone and everything like a member of our family, not just the humans, but everything that shares this earth. Everything is your brother, your sister, your father, your mother, your auntie, your uncle, or your grandparents, or all of them. We are all connected. It is not a choice. It is the way that it was created to be. We all need to be heard and acknowledged, and we all need to be believed, but especially those who have not been heard have not been acknowledged or have not been believed in the past. Listen, listen with your ears, but really listen with your heart. Mm -hmm. We give thanks to creator for holding our hands and guiding us, for being patient with us as we journey and we get to know each other. We give thanks that our eyes will be open to all that is around us that our ears will truly hear what is spoken and unspoken. We give thanks that our hearts will hold these things with tenderness 
and kindness, with thankfulness, and most of all, with gratitude until we are able to gather again. Stay healthy, stay safe, and walk well. Now we all my relations. Miigwech, miigwech, miigwech. That was amazing. Excellent. Scott, do you have any other questions that we want to pass on? Or Sandy, do, are there comments you want to make uh, uh, as we head into these next 15 minutes or so? I did want to say someone had asked for the, the document of the 10 steps, so I put it in chat. You could literally click on it and download it to your computer. You have to scroll up a little bit because there's so many comments, uh, but the document is there. So uh, feel free to, and if for some reason you don't get it, I am literally an email away. I will happily send it to you, so. Um, I do have one other question. Someone mentioned that the April 12th is not on the website yet, and that is correct. Uh, it's still, uh, we're just nailing down all the logistics. Uh, so and uh, when we, we'll be sending out a recording of this presentation uh, as soon as possible. And along with that recording, uh, we'll, and it'll, be, it'll be sent out to everyone who's registered for this session. So if you're on uh, this call now, you will be getting a follow-up email that has the, a link to the recording of this session, and it will also have the details on the um, on on how to register for the next session on April twelfth. We just don't have it all set up yet because it's it's only come together in the last couple of days. Um, and yes, Abram is reminding me. I'm glad he did. Um, what is the site address for the quiz on white privilege? I was ran, I was madly searching before we got to the Q and A time and I couldn't find it and then I forgot about it and I'm glad that Abram's reminding me. Do you have it handy Sandy or? I just posted in chat all you got to do is google unpacking the invisible knapsack and you will see it's by Peggy McIntosh. I I can't remember what year it came out. There's different versions of it whether it's the original article or you can actually get download printable version that she's made available, but it's called Unpacking the Invisible Knapsack, a white exercise in white privilege, I think it's called. There's there's a link, Herb, way to go. Okay. So power of Google. Yes. <laughs> He's got yeah. Google and he knows how to use it. That's fantastic. Thank well you. there's a couple different versions out there apparently. So but yeah. 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 I think the original one is like 26 points long and she really stresses that when she wrote the quiz she was listing 26 things that applied to her she wasn't saying they apply to all white people or whatever they applied specifically to her and she asked that we remember that when you do the quiz but when you go through it and realize how many apply to you or don't apply um yeah actually i used to have a tv show called the learning curve and it was all about this process, the steps we need to take. And I actually, one of my crazy ideas that wasn't the best crazy idea I've ever had, one of my friends that I've known for ages, non-Indigenous female, we got hold of the quiz and I was like, here's the idea. And by the way, my show was live. So no do-overs. <laughs> I said, you go do the quiz. I'm gonna do the quiz. And then on air, we will share the results. And this is gonna be awesome. And I thought it was a good idea again. <laughs> so cameras are rolling and I'm waiting and it was out of 26. And I think I got like 16 out of 26 that I could say the rest, I don't have that privilege. So I was like, I was curious, what do you have? And I looked at her and she was so embarrassed. And she was like, Sandy, I got 26. And I was like floored. It was like, are you serious? Right? And she was like, I'm scared to ask what you got. But the point was, we've been friends for like two decades and never had that discussion. Never realized how different our lives were living in the same area, in the same city. 
And it turned out to be the most amazing discussion. So I highly encourage you do the quiz, but don't be surprised if you're surprised <laughs> at the results. But uh, I was like, seriously, there's someone with that much privilege. And she was like, oh my God, I feel so bad. And it's like, don't, you didn't ask for the privilege. But by the way, guess who I'm calling the next time a door doesn't open for me. <laughs> I got you on speed dial now, girl. <laughs> so. Yeah. yeah.